Welcome back to the Japan Asia CC US Forum 2020. Uh, my name is Hiroshi Nambo, a branch representative of Global CCS Institute. I believe you have enjoyed part one and part two of this forum, and we would like to just start part three now. I will speak in Japanese from now on. So for those who prefer English, please select English channel, click on global icon at Zoom function panel. So we would now like to start the next paper. And my name is Hiroshi Nambo from Global CCS Institute of Japan and also the PMC for this session. And uh, this part, uh, we will uh, take up the theme of future deployment of CCS in Asia with 2050 uh, perspective. And we have invited a um, representative of various countries, research institutes and uh, companies. Um, uh, regarding the CCS, uh, CCS US Global in CCS going forward. Institute. To begin CEO with, um, we'd like to ask uh, Mr. Vlad Page, uh, CEO of Global CCS Institute, to talk about the situation regarding CCS globally as well as the development stage um, uh, in Asia. So without further ado, Vlad, um, your presentation, please. Uh, and we'll go straight to the next one, please. Um, so the main point that I really wanted to make here is that CCS has been making enormous uh, strides for a very long time. And in fact, uh, if you take a look here, the background to CCS is that in fact, it's proven it's available and it's operating. And in fact, it's been operating since 1972 as uh, enhanced oil recovery. And the first dedicated CO2 storage actually began in 1996 with the Sleipner project, which of course is still operating today and is really the best demonstration in the world of the effectiveness of CCS and the stability of, of storage over a over very, very long period at very high volumes. Uh, and of course, uh, to date, we now have 260 megatons of anthropogenic CO2 stored from 20 operating projects. Uh, that was until recently 21. Uh, and of course, uh, Petronova at the moment is mothballed, so we have moved back to reporting 20. Petronova is on this uh, slide for good reason, because it, it remains uh, a significant uh, facility that as soon as uh, the market changes, I'm sure we'll go back into production. To the right of that red line uh, are the projects that are at either advanced stages of uh, development or are under construction. And there's a further 20 there. And I think that that's a testament to the growing strength of CCS as a part of the solution to climate challenge. If I can have the next slide, please. Next slide. Great, thank you. Um, and I think that this chart is particularly encouraging for us. Uh, you'll see that at uh, 2017, uh, we very much reached the bottom of a long-term decline in the total numbers of projects and the total potential storage as a result of that. And we've seen since the signing of the Paris Agreement and moving forward now as increasing numbers of companies and governments are taking climate action and putting policies in place, both at a corporate level and a government level, that that pipeline is rebuilding and rebuilding very, very quickly. And the numbers we're reporting here are as at the end of May. So they're a few months old now, and we know that the numbers are greater. Uh, and we'll be reporting those in the next month or so as we release our, our annual status of CCS report. But what you can see very, very clearly here is that CCS is definitely on the increase again, uh, both in terms of the numbers of operating uh, facilities, the numbers that are in uh, advanced development, and those that are coming along right at the start of the pipeline. So this is this is really good news for us. If we can get the next slide, please. I think one of the things that we've been reflecting on for some time now, but which uh, with each passing year is reinforced even more, is that the business model now for CCS is very much around industrial CCS hubs, sometimes also called clusters. 
Uh, this this uh, approach we can now identify in the world that there are 15 roughly uh, CCS hubs either in existence, but most of them are in planning at this stage and advancing quite quickly in many instances. They provide the economies of scale around that transport and storage end of the uh, value chain. They provide the commercial synergies that are so necessary for us to move on to a much, much better uh, uh, um, commercial proposition for those who need to actually capture and dispose of their CO2. And by doing uh, a disaggregation of the value chain, we, we reduce these cross-chain risks that for so long have presented as a serious barrier to progression. The other thing that we're seeing is they're being driven by this increasing need for creation of low emission industrial precincts. We're seeing that especially in Europe at the moment, and we're increasingly starting to see that philosophy spread throughout the world. And I think really importantly, this, this sort of model and where these hubs are occurring is that they are starting to present as a very feasible option for uh, achieving what the UNFCCC has as one of its objectives, a just transition for communities that have relied for a long time on both high energy use, but high emission industries. And CCS is going to hold the key for these industries to move into a place where they're actually low emission, vital industries into the future. What I find interesting is that what we're now seeing is that the lowest cost opportunities in some of these industrial CCS hubs are as low as 15 to $25 a ton for CO2 for high concentration gas streams. So some of these include uh, applications in natural gas processing and bioethanol and in various chemical processes as well. So if we can have the next slide, please. I think one of the discussions that we're gonna have into the future from here is, is certainly around net zero, but increasingly it's around carbon management. And this, this graph uh, is something that we've done based on the IPCC's 1.5 report, but you'll also find this in a report we recently released that we authored in conjunction with Columbia University on the role of CCS in the net zero emission future. And the really important point about this is that three of those four pathways in the 1.5 degree report actually require CCS around carbon dioxide removal primarily. Somebody earlier today pointed to this and they quoted the 348 gigaton um, the requirement to be stored this year from carbon capture and storage. That's actually the bottom number. The top number is 1,218 gigatons. So in excess of 1,000 gigatons of CO2, this century potentially required to be stored using CCS. That is an enormous challenge in front of us, but it does show that it is absolutely central if we're to achieve these aggressive Paris targets that are necessary for the climate, that we definitely require CCS. Next slide, please. And the good news is that there's actually more than enough geological storage capacity around the world. Um, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but the numbers here are in gigatons of estimated storage capacity, and the different colours represent the degree of confidence that you can have around the numbers that are there. And you'll see that in the uh, mid blue, the, the navy blue, if you like, uh, there's actually some enormous numbers there through the Americas in particular. There's some significant numbers through Europe, but also some enormous numbers in China. And the point to all of this is that there is more than enough storage in the world to achieve what the IPCC and others forecast may be necessary from CCS. Sure, there's a lot of work to prove up in some areas, the actual expected volumes, but in many, many areas, we already have very high degrees of confidence around those numbers. Next, please. And so really uh, the opportunity with CCS is to create near zero emission industries. And for too long, CCS has been regarded as somehow only applicable to coal fired power generation. When in fact, we know very, very well that in fact, it's, it's one of the most flexible uh, technologies for addressing, especially the hard to abate sectors around steel, around cement, fertilizers, natural gas processing, of course and increasingly into the future, the production of clean hydrogen. Um, 
power plants are still relevant and still, especially in Asia, a great set of opportunities for the application of CCS. But it is a very broadly applicable technology. And we actually see in our catalogue of projects that the facilities in CCS are, are predominantly in, in uh, industries other than power generation at the moment. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to move very quickly through this because we have a range of speakers coming up shortly who will actually delve into some of these elements more significantly than I've got the time to right now. Uh, but just to cover across some of the developments that are going on in Asia at the moment, uh, and I think first of all, you have to single out China with the recent announcement by uh, Xi Jinping that China is committing to peak emissions by 2030 and to actually re reach net zero emissions by 2060. And that says to me that to achieve that, China undoubtedly is going to have to deploy CCS at large scale, if only to achieve carbon dioxide removal objectives. But I expect with the nature of their industrial base, uh, CCS will be required to be applied to a whole range of processes as well. Uh, also in China, the Green Bond Endorsed Projects Catalogue for 2020 for the first time has included CCS, and that provides a new potential source of financing for CCS there. I think encouragingly in Singapore, we're now seeing a, a deep engagement around CCS uh, after Singapore published its long-term low emissions development strategy, uh, and low carbon fuels and CCS are now a feature of their policy. In Australia, it's been uh, really refreshing over the last month or two to see a range of new announcements from the government uh, around uh, including CCS as one of its five priority technologies in its first low emissions technology statement and significant amounts of funding being provided to actually shore up that support. Of course, there's some budget and uh, legislative changes required. So there's a little way to go before we see those come to life but with uh, a little bit of goodwill from both sides of politics, hopefully that will come through. Um, our good friends in Indonesia are also engaged and Repsol together with Petronas and Moiko um, made a large gas find in, the, in South Sumatra some time ago uh, with around two TCF of recoverable resources, but it is very high in CO2 concentrations. And so there is a project now examining transporting the separated CO2 to depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs for underground storage. And I think that that is probably a model that we're going to see increasingly in the gas processing industry as well. Petronas in Malaysia, of course, uh, also have work on CO2 storage um, in Sarawak. Uh, and with FID, we understand likely in 2022 and hopefully injection in 2025. And I won't go on further there as we have a speaker from Petronas shortly. And also uh, in uh, Indonesia, the Gundi CCUS project uh, between J -Power, with JPower and Janus uh, receiving funding from the Japanese government uh, to actually do a feasibility study there is, is a great breakthrough as well. And, uh, and another testament to the outstanding contribution that Japan continues to make to CCS. And just to round this, this up, and I'm going as quickly as I can, given the time I wasted at the start here, um, we are also uh, watching, and I have visited this facility, and it's a hugely exciting uh, to see Toshiba's Bex demonstration project at Mekoa uh, coming along. Uh, and I enjoyed uh, standing on the initial pilot phase um, tower when it was built, but to now see that, uh, that that project is coming along quickly is really, really encouraging and another um, testament to the, the commitment to CCS in Japan. Um, we're also seeing China Energy Investment Corporation Jinji Carbon Capture Project in Shanxi province. Um, 150,000 tonnes of CO2 per year captured from a coal-fired power station um, I think this is quite an exciting development in China and reinforces once again that, that China's ambition in the climate space will require significant investments in CCS over the coming decades. And finally, and this has been reflected on already a great deal today, uh, but the next stage for Tomokamai is, is now underway and being planned 
and with that Indi industry consortium funded by Netto to research the effective recycling of carbon dioxide from the refinery at Tamokamai City in Hokkaido is just the next stage of commitment to CCS and CCUS of the Japanese government. Um, so from my perspective, there's no greater need for CCS in the world geographically than in Asia more broadly. It is the fastest growing part of the world. It is part of the world where emissions are growing the fastest. And it's the part of the world that's the most exciting to do this, this work in. All of the speakers that are going to follow me have outstanding stories to tell and experiences to share with us. And I think at this stage, the best thing I can do is, is stop uh, and move on for us to then uh, involve other speakers here and, uh, and start the panel discussion. So um, I think I'm broadly on time. I'm possibly a little late, um, but, but let's see how we get along. Um, so what I'd, what I'd like to do is finish those slides, if we can take those down now, please. Thank you, Brad. Yeah. Okay, so I'd like to introduce the <coughs> panelists for myself. And uh, the panel discussion today is the future deployment of CCS in Asia with 2015 in our perspective. And how we're going to proceed with the panel discussion is that um, each of the panelists will make a, about a five minute a short presentation about this theme to begin with. Then after that, uh, Mr. Um, Brad Page will uh, facilitate the discussion. And so first, uh, the discussion would be uh, someone who has been involved in a carbon net project for quite many years as part of the Victoria uh, State Government in Australia. Uh, the, the project manager of um, the, the carbon net project, Mr. Ian Philby. So, Ian, over to you now. Thank you very much for the opportunity to join you here today. Um, I've only got a five minutes to give you a, a brief update on carbon net. So uh, perhaps uh, I'd just like to introduce uh, CarbonNet as a project down here in Australia. Uh, can everyone see that introductory slide? Yep. So CarbonNet is a, a jointly funded CCS project by the Australian and uh, Victorian governments. It's a long-term initiative over a decade of joint funding, uh, a decade of collaboration across governments and with industry to develop a CCS hub uh, here in Victoria in Gippsland. Um, we do have a, a video that uh, I understand we might be able to play. Um, so as perhaps I continue to talk, if uh, members are able to start the video, um, would that be all right? Yes. Hold a second, please. No worries. So CarbonNet is a, uh, I guess, a industrial hub type project. Uh, it's based in Gippsland. We've got excellent geology and we've got a, an industrial sector as well that's looking at evolving into new industries, particularly industries like hydrogen and fertilizer production. We've got some great synergies with the hydrogen energy supply chain project, but also natural gas processing and fertilizer manufacturing. So uh, you've got a great opportunity in terms of our storage site, uh, Pelican, that's located close to uh, those industrial um, facilities. But it's been a really big year of progress for CarbonNet. Uh, during the year, we completed uh, an appraisal well at the Pelican site. And we'll see some footage of that in a few moments. Uh, it was a major operation. We mobilized a drilling rig and undertook uh, the drilling operations during December and January. Uh, the data collected has given us increased confidence in the Pelican site. Uh, in particular, we know that the seals are good and the reservoir uh, is able to take a significant injection capacity, multi-Darcy. Uh, reservoir. So uh, we're very pleased with the uh, with the drilling of the well. 
Um, all of our work, our engineering work, has allowed us to prepare a declaration of storage. That's a, a regulatory application. Um, that went through an international peer review last year. So world leading experts in carbon dioxide storage uh, reviewed our science and gave us a tick and noted that the Pelican site is of world class. So we're very pleased with that. Um, and I guess what that has done is given us confidence to engage with industry. Um, uh, at the end of 2019, the Victorian government released a request for industry submissions. Uh, some very positive support from our ministers, uh, the Minister for Resources and the Minister for Economic Development, uh, really presented uh, CarbonNet as a unique opportunity here in Victoria to be at the forefront of hydrogen and fertiliser manufacturing. Um, so uh, we're very pleased with the response we got from industry. Um, there's a lot of opportunity there for us to collaborate with industry as we seek to commercialise the project. You'll also be seeing some engagement work we, do it, we did with uh, students. Um, we did a lot of engagement work with the public. Uh, we ran some science programs. Over 300 people attended uh, this event that was held at the Gippsland Technical College. And it really shows that uh, engaging with people and bringing them on the journey with us is so important. And I guess the last thing I wanted to acknowledge was um, the policy announcements that, um, that Brad was referring to here in Australia. The Commonwealth Government released a, a, low, uh, a low emissions technology roadmap with some significant commitments to funding. Uh, totaling $18 billion over the next decade into low emission technologies like hydrogen and CCS. So I would say the prospects for CCS and hydrogen here in Australia are strong. And I certainly look forward to, uh, I guess, participating in the panel uh, with Brad and, and the other colleagues from around the world. Thank you. え、それでは続きまして、インドネシア政府、え、エネルギー投資支援庁のダイレクターオイルアンドガステクニカルアンドエンバイロメンタルアフェアーズのえ、ドクターアディウィボボさん。ウィボボさんよろしくお願いい
uh, oil well in Sumatra, South Sumatra, but Repsol still not yet come to me to talk about this. However, we have at least four area also mentioned by Brad Page, Kundi, uh, Sukwati, uh, Kundi is uh, done by the help of uh, ITB in Japan, uh, Meti as well, Sukawati is done by part, part of the study is funded by uh, uh, ADB and also we have uh, Limau uh, field in Sumatra and I think you, you will hear from Rizal after, after this from the PP Tangu in uh, Papua, Papua in the most eastern part of our, our area, Indonesia, Indonesian island. That's uh, become uh, uh, one of the uh, promising of, uh, uh, gas, gas uh, field in the new future. Uh, next, please. This is the brief project of the Kundi. I, I think you can, uh, have, you can read this and this has been done by the, uh, some funding, funding from NEDO and from Japan. Uh, next, please. And I already said that this uh, part of the study, primary study, is funded by ADB with the help of Patel Consultant. And at the moment, Pertamina is still doing for the detailed study to become a full field project. And the target is next year to 2021 because uh, at 2021, the uh, gas field, the, what we call the, the one of the biggest gas field in Java Island in Indonesia, the Jambaran Tiung Biru will be operated, it will be in operation. So the gas will be captured and then will be uh, injected to get more uh, Enhance, enhance gas recovery. Next, please. This is Tango. I think I will not uh, talk about this much because I think Lisa will talk more about uh, the development of uh, Tango CCUS. Uh, next, next, please. please. Yeah, we have some challenges for UCCUS development in Indonesia that as you know that more, many, still many contract oil and gas in Indonesia is in the form of PSC, means sharing, sharing by, by government, government and, and uh, private. So we still talk about uh, this. If uh, some uh, company uh, will uh, have the decision to uh, develop the CCUS, as well as we still uh, have to be more familiar with carbon trading and carbon pricing, GCM and so on, as well as that we need uh, some fiscal incentive because business, uh, the, the business of CCUS, I mean, that is likely quite the same with the new energy, new renewable energy business. In Indonesia, the new renewable energy already get some uh, fiscal incentive so maybe this CCUS, we can also give some incentive. Uh, we can talk about this later. So that's, uh, I want to tell. Uh, I think we can talk more in the discussion later. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. はい、
あの国内のセッションは2部でありましたが、あの国際的な話をしていたときに、こういったことをディスカッションするのは非常に私たちは楽しみにしています。これはあの第2部でも説明しましたけれども、日本の今のプロジェクトということで、トマクマイをはじめ、その他の分離解消をしているデモンストレーションプロジェクトがあるということで、あの CCUS でとにかく日本を知っ限られませんけれども、日本が世界に何で地球の中対策で貢献できるかというと、やはり技術なわけでございます。分離回収のところで、いかにコストを下げるかということは、非常に日本ができる、貢献できると思います。それこそ、もう一つ、新しい展開としまして、真ん中にございます CO2 の輸送の船舶の実証をやりたいというふうに検討しているところでございます。CO2 の船舶輸送というのは、例えばノルウェーでも今、ちょうど検討されていますが、いずれこの CCUS を国際的に進めようと思うと、こうした船舶の輸送ということは必要になってくるわけでございます。国境を越えた CO2 の輸送ということが可能になるということでございます。ただ、この輸送に関しても、まだ課題があるということで、これをいち早く日本が実証して、こうした解決策を示すというのは、世界の CCUS の発展によって、それが起こることだというふうに考えています。次のページでございます。次のページでございます。それで、あのー、これまでも、あのー、日本は CCUS に関しまして、えー、各国と協力をしてまいりました。例えば EU とも協力をしてまいりました。共同のステートメントを発信しています。イギリスとも CCUS に関して対話をしています。サウジアラビアとは例えば CCUS を発信しています。CO2 フリーアンモニアのサプライチェーンを作っていて、カナダとはこれはあの JCCS ジャパン CCS 調査がインターナショナル CCS なるセンターで CCS を And with Australia, we have hydrogen energy supply chain project. And just last week, with Australia, on a bilateral basis, we had the Japan Australia CCUS dialogue was held just last week. So we have international collaboration ongoing with the different territories and countries. This is quite important for Japan. One thing in order to further advance. 活用する可能性があるというツールの紹介でございます。Now, これがあのサビ協定の6条に基づくスキームでございますが、ジョイントクレディティングメカニズム JCM というスキーム、これは構図にあります通り、日本の低炭素技術を相手国に提供しています。それによって減らされる CO2 の削減量をクレジット化して利用国で利用してしまうと。And the two countries will be able to define for renewable energy as well as energy efficiency. We have been utilizing the JCM, and we have had the many. Uh, good uh, results and case studies, but we have never used this and applied this for CCUS. So we have been studying on the joint crediting mechanism to possibly apply to CCUS as well. Next slide. As Mr. Oibo has introduced to us, for example, Indonesia has been discussing the joint crediting mechanism could be utilized for example, in Indonesia. Joint crediting mechanism could be utilized to have a project on CCUS. So feasible. Feasibility study is being conducted for this purpose. And as part of the feasibility study, Japan Indonesia CCUS Symposium was held. And in Indonesia, in order to implement the project, what could be the challenges to be overcome? The government and business leaders have come together to have a discussion. 
それで、あの、今日のテーマでございますが、アジアにおいてはいずれにしましても、その経済発展とともに、やはりそのスタンス化ということは大きな課題でございます。それと、脱炭素化に関しては、その大規模削減ができる CCUS というのは、大きな課題でございます。今日、さまざまなプレゼンがありますが、アジアで、一言で言えば、こうしたノウハウだとか、技術だとか、そういうものを持っていきたいと思います。The know-how, the expertise, and technology need to be shared by the different countries. Perhaps we can establish a platform to make this happen. And later, there will be a presentation, I believe, that area. We have been working with the area to try to establish the CCUS network, and we will be making a proposal on this. So capacity building included. We need to deepen the understanding of the public on CCUS, and in the future, within the region, we would like to create the network. So on a cross-border basis, we could possibly have CCUS projects. Which could lead eventually to decarbonization of the region. And、uh, this is something we need to discuss today as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kawaguchi. Next, we have from Petronas in Malaysia, head of Sarawak Malaysia Resources Development and Malaysia Petroleum Management. Zakaria san ni presentation o n a i s h i m a s Zakaria. So please. The floor is yours. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Good, good afternoon, everyone.、Um, I'm Juan Atika、uh, from Petronas. Is being introduced.、I'd、like to share my screen now. Yes, please. All right. Can you see、uh, the presentation slide? Yes. 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 We can see.、It. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you to the organizer.、Um, and today I'll be sharing、um, the Petronas's CCS CCUS efforts in、uh, Malaysia. So as you can see, what we have here is our sustainability development plan, and we have actually started、um, our our Petronas carbon commitment in 2012, and so far there's a cumulative of 12 million tons of CO2 emission,、uh, or GHG emissions being reduced so far. And we also have enhanced and also、uh, established our Petronas Carbon Commitment Guidelines. And、uh, moving forward, as mentioned earlier,、uh, the plan is to have our aspiration is to have our first CO two injection、um, in year twenty twenty five twenty twenty six. Okay.、Um, so everybody has talked about Paris Agreement. And for Malaysia itself,、uh, we have committed nationally、um, 65 million tons of CO2、uh, emission reduction. And、uh, me being in MPM or Malaysia Petroleum Management, our role is to govern and regulate and steer the、uh, petr、uh, the contractors to、uh, petroleum sharing contractors to actually whenever that they submit anything. Um, for their high CO2 fields,、uh, they are supposed to come up with zero continuous venting of hydrocarbon, as well as、uh, CO2 emission allowance should be part of the planning process for high CO2 field development. And for high CO2 field development, also、uh, what they are required to do is to have to incorporate the carbon capture utilization. Storage technologies at the design stage itself, or else we won't be able to approve the development plan. Okay.、Um, we are also looking at renewable energy、um, next to our effort in CC, CCS and CCS. 
Okay. So since we only have five minutes, uh, I'll focus more on the roadmap actually. So for this year itself, the focus is more about uh, establishing um, this, this mapping, regional uh, basin mapping of our CO2, uh, as well as um, development of our CO2 sequestration area development. Over here, what we're trying to focus is more on from source to sink, we look at several depleted reservoirs and to also look at whether we can establish a hub per se, for example, in, in one of the regions um, and uh, making it uh, beneficial. So all the operators for, who actually produce high CO2, once they capture it, they can actually inject it to a centralized hub. At the same time, um, we've also finalized our uh, storage development plan for our Kasawari project, uh, which the intent is to, we are, should be able to achieve final investment decision in year 2022. With this current situation where everyone is doing uh, CAPEX rationalization, uh, it seems that we are still going ahead with uh, our first injection. Hopefully, the aspiration is to inject it by year early 2026. At the same time, we also launched, uh, during our Malaysia bid round, we launched a, a joint study with, um, with uh, several contractors um, for, to look at what would be the solutions for high CO2 development in Peninsular Malaysia. The studies is ho uh, hopefully we can complete the studies in year 2021. And in this study itself, we have emphasized that we would like to see utilization, CO2 utilization, as part of the submission for our consideration. Um, we also have our arm to actually, our technology arm, who look at various technologies uh, ranging from capture. Uh, all the way down to utilization. And um, we are looking for partners actually to collaborate with us, whether in the, during the operatorship as well as as part of our technology partners. Okay. If you are not aware of our latest and biggest um, gas discovery, uh, Lang Lebah. So Lang Lebah will be producing in uh, probably late, early, late or early 2025. And they are also supposed, the contractor, the PSC contractor is supposed to um, sequester their CO2 as well. And the study currently is ongoing, whether it's going to be near shore or offshore sequestration. So far, uh, as far as the study is concerned, it looks like it's a, we are moving towards um, near shore um, sequestration. So hopefully, by year 2025, 2026, and 2027, is going to be, um, hopefully Petronas will be able to achieve our aspiration, that is to inject um, this uh, CO2, high CO2 uh, to our depleted reservoirs, hopefully. All right. So, um, and in year 2023, this is where we hope to get some, some get to hope solutions for our uh, to monetize our high CO2 fields in Peninsula Malaysia. Okay. I think with that I'd like to end my presentation. We discuss more during the panel discussion. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for the, the presentation. Next, um, uh, would be a presentation from um, the Special Advisor on Energy Affairs um, from the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, uh, Kimura. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Kimura from ASEAN. Today, I'd like to talk about the uh, energy output that uh, we have published, and we'd like to utilize that data to talk about the, the position of the U.S. in ASEAN. Please operate the slide.
はい、まずあの、EAS エネルギーアウトロックの,アウトロックの説明ですけども、EAS エネルギーアウトロックの EAS 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 エネル
uh, continues to be quite dominant um, as far as um, the energy dependency is concerned. Next slide. If that is the case, the CO2 emission will also grow at the same time, 3.2 times. Right now, uh, it's uh, the 380 million tons, but this will increase 1.2 billion tons. And ASEAN um, has uh, the energy, um, the conservation target or renewable energy take-up ratio. Even if we were able to achieve that, then CO2 uh, is likely to be reduced by some 28%. But still, um, 876 million tons uh, will, or CO2 will be emitted at uh, 2.23 to 2.4 times. Um, uh, and as I um, said before, uh, for ASEAN, uh, for power generation, we are still dependent on coal and oil. Now, in 2050, if we see commercial um, the implementation of CCUS, um, then CCUS is applied to all fired and coal fired thermal power plants, then the amount of CO2 emission can further be reduced by a further 40%. Uh, Totaling 525 million tons. So that's about 1.3 to 1.4 times the level in 2017. And what remains uh, would be uh, oil. Or, uh, petroleum that is used for transportation purposes and direct air capture um, I think is a type of technology that is available but um, ICE uh, from um, the uh, electric vehicle and hydrogen vehicle when we see that uh, shift then we may be able to reduce uh, a large amount of CO2 uh, generated by the transportation sector. Next, uh, is a uh, summary, a summary slide. Uh, based on stable economic growth, we expect the energy demand to continue to grow, uh, particularly for uh, oil and electricity, oil for transportation, uh, for electricity, uh, coal and gas, uh, where we will continue to uh, depend uh, for power generation. That means a um, large amount of CO2 will be established. So CCUS in that respect uh, is going to be uh, very important um, usable energy technology uh, in the future for the ASEAN region. Accordingly, CCUS, how can we uh, take this to a commercial level in the ASEAN region? That will become very important. And for that purpose, as uh, Mr. Kawajiguchi has explained before, in the Asian region, including ASEAN, uh, for the region as a whole, need to uh, come up with a policy for uh, CCUS or the demonstration project for CCUS. We need to create a network to, to help that or promote that. We need that kind of forum. Uh, to enable that. That is the summary that uh, I wanted to arrive at. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Kimura. Now, from Impex, we have Mr. Isao Takahashi, the General Manager of Technical Planning and Coordination Unit from Technical Division. Good afternoon, all. Um, to let my respect to my fellow presenter, let me present in English. Okay. okay um, first of all, I'm from the private sector, Impex, so there are several things that I'm not allowed to disclose at this moment, but I hope I can you know, share more on the GCS discussion in my company uh, in the near future. Next, please. Okay, just a quick introduction of Impex. Impex is the uh, biggest uh, oil and gas producer in Japan. We are working globally uh, in the five continents, but uh, our main activity areas are in Japan, Indonesia, and Australia. So this session uh, for Asia-Pacific CCS is very, very relevant for our future for IMPEX. And as our project grows and our production, oil and gas production increases, of course, our emission for the company increases. So uh, we set out, as in the left, uh, on the right side of the slide, we set out our, our mission that we will have to transform ourselves to, uh, to a sustainable energy de de deliverer, not just an oil company. So CCS and CCUS will be a key te technology for, for impacts future uh, as a sustainable energy provider. Next, please. Okay. Uh, 
Our interest in CCS has, if CCS has grown very rapidly in the recent years, but our history to CCS and CCS technology is very long. You know, uh, our first uh, CO2 EOR pilot project in Kubiki oil field in Niigata was the first of that kind in, uh, applied in Japan. And on the left uh, bottom, uh, Impex took also a very important role in the first uh, CCS pilot in uh, Iwanohara site in Niigata area, jointly with Wright. Uh, on the right side, uh, in Abu Dhabi, UAE, uh, where we have a very big uh, oil, oil asset, CO2 EOR is also a very uh, critical R&D topic, and we have been continuing our research uh, efforts uh, to, to upper and lower vacuum uh, fields. And we hope we can uh, reach a pilot uh, test in near future. And uh, on the low, lower right, it's not actually a CCS, but uh, we are very, you know, familiarized with uh, CO2 removal technology uh, through our energy plant and gas processing plant uh, in Darwin, uh, Australia, or over Ni Niigata. So. Uh, we feel we, we are technically ready to start any uh, CCS projects uh, as a company. Next, uh, please. So our recent CCS and CCUS activities are very much, uh, you know, uh, wide-ranging and uh, multi-dimensional. Uh, as set out and in our mission, we, we clearly define our low-carbon strategy for our future uh, form of impacts. And you know, around the clock, uh, we feel, you know, global networking, uh, like in this session, is very important for our catching up with CCS status and, uh, you know, uh, update of the local and global uh, CCS, CCS regulations. Of course, uh, as a Japanese company, uh, we, we, we feel we have to take advantage of all the, of all the running uh, that was done uh, in domestically. Uh, that's from uh, Iwanohara, Tomokomai, and other, you know, CCS site studies that's ongoing. Well, we do have internally uh, R&D activity for, for CCS uh, technology that I will touch a bit in the next slide. And finally, uh, not, not yet, please, yeah. Finally, our goal is to apply our CCS uh, to our, you know, upstream project in, in global uh, area, especially Australia, Indonesia, and Abu Dhabi. So that's our uh, ultimate goal for, for CCS. Next, uh, please. Uh, a little bit about uh, uh, recent techno technological update. Uh, as in other companies, uh, you know, our R&D de deployment starts from laboratory and desktop, and that will have to be verified in the pilot field uh, testing. We typically use our domestic oil and gas field for our technological development. And then we feel we want to apply this technology to, to all over the uh, world. On the right, uh, there's an image about the CO2 EOR uh, technology that we are, are developing. You know, CO2 EOR, EOR is a technology that uh, allows us both to inject CO2 to the subsurface and to uh, increase our oil production. But uh, the typical issue is that, like in the left-hand side of the image, the CO2 is very fluid, so it runs through the very high, high permeable zone. So typically, the, the remaining oil uh, remains in the reservoir. But we are developing a new technology based on foam to, uh, you know, uniformly sweep the reservoir to to enhance our efficiency of uh, our EOR. And we are pre preparing to uh, test this in our domestic oil field uh, in the near future. And then we want to apply this to our global projects. On the bottom part, uh, monitoring is also a very, you know, the key technology for doing CCS safe. And uh, we are, you know, investigating uh, fiber optics technology to uh, do our reservoir monitoring cheap and uh, uh, high quality. Okay, next brief. So that's my final slide. Uh, as uh, briefly mentioned, CCS and CCUS technology are crucial for our you know, future of impact to achieve our mission uh, to become a sustainable energy deliverer uh, as a company. And among, 
you know, available low carbon strategy like renewables or hydrogen. CCS and CCUS enables us, you know, cost-effective reduction of uh, large volume CO2 re uh, sequestration, taking advantage of our inherent technology like subsurface development and C CO2 removal. And that's why CCS and CCUS is one of the top R&D uh, focus for IMPEX and multi-dimensional efforts ongoing uh, to make it uh, practical and uh, efficient, low-cost jointly with our partners. So, IMPEX is very keen to contribute to enhanced application of CCS and CCUS in the Asia Pacific region where, you know, our major activities are in collaboration with our domestic and international partners. And, uh, but of course, appropriate policies and, you know, economic incentives are very essential for accelerating our move. That's it. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much uh, to Mr. Takahashi. Uh, this will be uh, the final short presentation BP Indonesia, from BP Indonesia, no, uh, British Petroleum uh, Director. Uh, we have uh, Business Liesl Development Ramnarain Director, Ms. Liesl uh, Ramnarain. So please, over to you, madam. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you to GC, GCCSI and all the supporting agencies, including NIDO. I'm trying to make this work. Um, can you see my screen? I don't, it's freezing. I don't know why it's not sharing. Oh. Let's see. Oh, it's starting. It's coming, coming. It's yes, it's here. Fine. Okay. Okay, so thank you again. I think forums like this are very much needed uh, as CCUS is new to many people in and education around CCUS and the role of CCUS, why do we need CCUS, is very, very key. Um, I should I should probably introduce myself. Uh, so I'm Liesl Ramnarain, I'm the Business Development Director for BP in Indonesia. And as Pat Adi uh, shared earlier, we are working on a CCUS project for Tangu. But before I get into that, I wanted to take a minute to just explain a little bit about BP and our strategy around carbon. I think you must have seen quite a lot of media coverage around uh, our new strategy. And BP is indeed pivoting from an international oil company to an integrated energy company over the next 10 years. So by 2030, we are aiming to cut our operational emissions by 30 to 35 percent, oversee absolute reductions in our emissions associated with the carbon in our upstream oil and gas production by 35 to 40 percent. This is an important metric because it sees those emissions fall by about 120 million tons of CO2 equivalent. We are also aiming to reduce the overall carbon intensity of the products that we sell by more than 15%. CCUS is going to be a very key part of how we deliver that because as we look forward, in order to meet the demand for low carbon energy, gas continues to be a key part of that energy mix and while wind solar waste and biomass are indeed increasingly important to meet power generation demand aviation fuel and other transportation fuel needs natural gas remains a key part of actually meeting growing demand and i think many of the participants before me spoke to this CCUS indeed enables a lower carbon energy system as part of the overall mix and as part of meeting energy demand in Asia Pacific and globally. So how are we getting into action on this? As well as the Tango project that we're evaluating, uh, one of the projects that we are working very hard on is net zero tea side in the UK. And this is one where it's an OGCI led project and BP is the operator. So OGCI is the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. It's a consortium of BP, ENI, Equinor, Shell, and Total. And we're working together in Teesside to actually gather emissions from quite a variety of 
plants. So these including gas power generation, biomass power generation, fertilizers, petrochemicals, uh, hydrogen manufacturing, and we're gathering those and injecting into an aquifer offshore. What we're hoping to accomplish here is to reduce 6 million tons every year that would otherwise have been emitted. As Pa'adi shared before on the Tangu project, uh, with the addition of our third LNG train, we would be emitting up to 8 million tons per annum. We're evaluating a project that possibly could reduce that by 3 million tons in the beginning and over 10 years, 30 million tons. And that project is one where we would be doing CCUS and not simply CCS. And this is part of meeting the dual challenge where we're actually using sequestration to enhance gas recovery. And with that, I would turn to part of, you know, why, why this panel is pulled together. What actually is needed to enable CCUS at scale in Asia Pacific? So I think, first of all, as many of us have discussed, uh, there is a dual, a dual challenge for us. We need affordable energy and we need clean air. In order for us to have a meaningful impact and actually be able to do many of these projects, regulation is important and working with governments to provide clear, stable and effective policy framework um, is necessary if companies are going to actually invest and use energy competitively while lowering emissions. And importantly, it's a build public confidence. The public has to actually appreciate the role of CCUS and why it's important. And governments play a, a key role in that in working with the industry to ensure that there is acceptance for this type of work. In addition to the clear regulations, a stable price to carbon and a liquid carbon market, and others have spoken to this before me, with clear rules will make energy efficiency more attractive. It actually will help pay for investments in CCUS and it will make that dual challenge something that we can meet where we have affordable energy and we actually can lower emissions at the same time. And with that, I'll hand back. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, Lisa, uh, Thank you very uh, much. So, this is the end of the short presentation. Now, all the short presentations uh, have been completed. Uh, we would like to have a discussion now. So, can I turn over to Thank you, Hiroshi. Can you let me know if you can hear me this time? I'm yes, yes, can. we can hear you. Perfect. Excellent. Excellent. The technology is working. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank all of the presenters uh, because I think that the ground that they've covered is quite extraordinary. Um, and of course, with their local knowledge, uh, much deeper information about all the things that are going on in their parts of the world than I could have possibly hoped to cover. And isn't it impressive to see just how big the focus now is on CCS across the Asia Pacific region. Um, there are many uh, questions in from the audience and in the time we've got, I'll do my best, but I give you no guarantees about covering them. Uh, but I do think that this first question that I'd like to pose to the panel does cover a number of them. Uh, and and I think it was interesting to uh, hear from Kimura-san um, just um, how large uh, some of the energy use requirements are going to be across the region in the coming 20 to 30 years and, and the significance of the emissions that will come from that as well. And I guess the question that I wanted to pose to the panel um, was really to ask just confine yourselves to what are the two most important things that will be needed to accelerate the deployment of CCUS in Asia. There could be many things in many parts of the world, but if we just focus on Asia, what are the two most important things that you think are needed to accelerate 
CCUS deployment in Asia. And Ian Philby, you and I are going to count ourselves as honorary Asians, even uh, because I, I honestly believe that Australia is part of Asia um, and we are, we are vitally connected to this part of the world. So, so Ian, can I uh, lead off with asking you uh, what your two most important things are that are needed to accelerate CCU, CCUS deployment in this part of the world? Thanks, Brad. Um, yeah, I mean, it was several of the speakers pointed out that CCS really needs a partnership between industry and governments. So we need to see those partnerships uh, emerge and turn into commercial scale projects. So the partnership is really important. But I would say that the other thing that is fundamentally important is government's role in activating the market. Uh, government has its hands on the levers and governments in each jurisdiction can choose which markets they want CCS to participate in to underpin. So those would be the two things, partnerships and government um, activating the market. Thanks very much, Thanks Ian. Much, yeah. uh, I wonder if uh, I could actually move now to uh, Kawaguchi-san. Uh, what, what would be your two things? はい、え、2つ出てございますので、1つは、あ、まだやっぱりアジアにどういったアクセスのポテンシャルがあるのかというのは、まだまだ調査していかなければいけないと思います。if we are, we need to have uh, advancement of priority level of CCUS in the Asian governments. I don't think priority of CCUS is not that high yet. So, as I have suggested today, within Asia, technology and experience and knowledge need to be shared. So, in the government as well as in the private sector, priority level and ranking of CCUS need to be elevated more. That is the second challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Waboo, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. What are the two most important things needed to accelerate the deployment of CCUS? Yes, thank, thank you. you. So as I mentioned, we now in the renewable energy, we have some fiscal incentives. So I think we will, in my opinion, we should give also as well uh, fiscal incentive to uh, this uh, CCUS activities, uh, as well as the uh, carbon trading mechanism, uh, joint credit mechanism is more more become more familiar. So, because many of uh, oil company uh, or, or oil and gas company here in Indonesia still not yet uh, to not know about what is the CCM or carbon trading. However, in my opinion, that, that, that kind of carbon trading is uh, one of potential how to reduce the, the cost. Because as you know that with the CCUS, CCUS or CUS, that means the externalities we will put in internal. So all the costs that uh, before that um, in the, within the external system, system will be put in the internal means the price will be higher uh, as well as for the consumer or the producer. So that uh, maybe government or or, or carbon trading uh, can lower this this uh, this commodity price. Thank you very much for that. Um, Ms. Wan Atika, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what should we do to accelerate CCUS? All right, so um, just like stimulus packages that we have for COVID-19, right? I believe the government should also <laughs> yeah, um, um, have some incentives. But in Malaysia, I would like to share, actually um, for high CO2 fields, um, anything ranging beyond 20% of CO2, in the gas, uh, we can actually have a uh, tax uh, reduction 
when you develop all these fields because you know to monetize um, high CO2 fields is very capex intensive, right? At the same time, I also feel that um, the government should also provide grants uh, and also operational support for anything uh, alongside other than CCUS, uh, other clean energy um, initiatives, uh, maybe by, uh, by private sectors as well. Okay, and at the same time, I think the key word here was mentioned earlier by one of the panelists is to have partnership. Okay, so when you have partnership in terms of your storage, utilization, um, we can actually establish a regional, a regional uh, storage site. And uh, in fact, um, I believe one of the Japanese companies has approached us to store their CO2 uh, in, in Malaysia. And uh, like mentioned earlier by you, uh, storage sites are available, right? Plenty of it. It's just that what we need to nail down is basically um, our gaps. When, when we look at our gaps, it will be in terms of utilization, you know, it's market demand and whatnot, um, as well as the technology itself, technology to capture and store and to ensure that it stays there in the reservoir or, or anywhere else that we store the uh, CO2. Okay, so that would be my, my thoughts. Thank you very much for your thoughts. They, they yeah, yeah. are very helpful. Um, uh, I, would, I would like to, uh, I'm, I will come to you, Kimura-san, uh, since I used your comments to, uh, to set this up, but I'd like to go to Takahashi-san at this, at this moment uh, from INPEX to understand with the ambition that INPEX has around this, what are the two things you're looking for to actually be able to accelerate your deployment of, of CCUS in this region. You know, like my, my fellow presenters commented, I think the government support and economic incentives are the two things, but to you know, expand the discussion as a part of the economic incentive, you know, if people want to pay more money to cleaner energy, like uh, carbon neutral energy, so that margin can you know, pay out uh, CCS. So uh, development of like, uh, Carbon neutral energy or, or, or clean form of uh, energy market may, you know, accelerate uh, the application. Thank you. And uh, uh, Ms. Ramnerin, um, I'm interested in in what the BP view is because, of course, a very ambitious uh, and big change in strategic direction for the company. Um, and I'm sure that there's much capital going to be deployed and is being deployed within BP already, but. What are the, some of the factors that you need to see coming through from, say, government policy to actually support an aggressive rollout of CCUS? Thank you, Brian. Um, so I mentioned a couple, and I think several of the panelists have talked about that partnership, the collaboration with government, some clear regulation around CCUS uh, and how they would regulate CCUS activities. And I think in Asia Pacific, how that fits within a PSC framework, that needs to be clear. I would, I would second, you know, some of the comments around a carbon market and having a transparent, clear carbon market, having emissions trading regulations in place that are not only within the boundary of the country, but to echo an earlier panelist, uh, looking at what can we do across ASEAN? What can we do to actually help develop trading among the countries rather than only within the market in the country? But I think to add to what everyone else has said, there's an element of pace here. Uh, everybody's talked about timing and, and when they want to hit the targets. So moving a little bit faster on those fronts and actually making that jump from doing studies and pilots to actually Getting, our, getting ourselves into real commercial projects uh, of what's going to make a difference and, and, and helping that collaboration between government and industry, whether it's oil and gas or other industries, power generation is a key part here. I mean, it's going to be key to actually make us start doing it, um, do it sooner, learn, and then do the next one better. Yeah. Thank you very much. And Kamura san I left you to last for, for a very um, sneaky reason, really, since you're from the Economic Research uh, Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. Um, much of the discussion and quite a few of the questions that I've been reading are around this carbon market and about carbon prices. 
and and I'm interested in your thoughts on what are the the two most important things. But I wonder if you could address how you would see um, a carbon price uh, playing into this consideration, and how important is a carbon price in your view? Uh, Camilla San, I think you're on mute. <laughs> the two factors I want to raise are the following. One is commercialization to promote technology advancement and CCS to be used in an affordable manner. Uh, there's a lot of uh, contribution from the advanced uh, industrialized nations uh, in this regard. When these are affordable, uh, then uh, the ASEAN countries can use the CCS technology. That's important. That is ASEAN and Asian countries or the developing countries in ASEAN do not have money and they do not have the technology either so that advanced industrialized countries must cover for them. And the other uh, this is the CCS value chain. For example, Singapore has a lot of gas-fired uh, uh, power generation plants, and uh, that generates CO2. Uh, see, Singapore, I think, can capture, but uh, as to where to store, uh, that is the problem. So in the Asian region, to promote the CCS uh, a value chain is important. You capture and you transport, and then you have to store uh, such a network or a system has to be launched. Uh, that is not something one nation can do alone. It has to be addressed by the region as a whole. That's important. Uh, on uh, the uh, carbon price, carbon price uh, is such that uh, uh, it will be a tailwind for CCS uh, when the uh, carbon price goes up. CCS uh, price competitiveness uh, rises. However, if we look at the present uh, carbon pricing, it's not that high. So, will it really be a tailwind for CCS? So that is something where we do not know. But uh, the government, well, the, the carbon market is important, but the strong will on the part of the government, that's also necessary. And, as I explained earlier, for ASEAN as a whole, for the moment, it's about $5,000, a little less than $5,000 or less, that's uh, per capita GDP. Uh, when it comes to other countries, uh, Japan, Europe, United States, they have a much higher GDP per capita. So uh, uh, the same uh, scheme would not work for ASEAN. So uh, carbon uh, will be a, a tailwind, but the carbon market whether that could be uh, applied to ASEAN is something that we have to look carefully at and try to figure out if it's appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much, much Mr. Mr. And, and, and I'd just like to add a little bit to that because I think too often we, we get caught on talking about carbon prices and carbon markets rather than thinking about valuing carbon. And I think uh, the mechanisms in some ways matter little the real issue is that, is that around the world, there are very few places where you can see that there is a real value placed on carbon, whether it's for use or whether it's for simply removing it from entering the atmosphere. And when you look at things like the 45Q tax credit, it shows you that you don't necessarily have to be applying a price, you have to apply a value. And that seems to me to be an important, but not, but not the only element. Um, we have very little time left. Uh, and I have so many questions, I'm simply not going to get to them. I've attempted instead to frame some questions here that touch on many. But there, there are one or two questions here that I think we might just try to touch on. Uh, the first one, uh, Takahashi-san, I wonder if you would mind answering uh, a question uh, that somebody has here because they are interested in the INPEX intention to deploy CCS and CCUS, but they are also asking, uh, do you actually have agreements and arrangements in many of the countries that you would be intending to do this? How, how are you interfacing with those countries to actually fulfil your ambition? Okay, um, you know, to my knowledge, there's uh, currently no, uh, you know, uh, 
requirement or obligation for, for impacts to do uh, CCS in Australia or Indonesia at this moment. I don't know about the future, uh, but I, I think the company's intention is maybe not as much as BP or other European companies, but uh, we, we are committed to to uh, you know emit lower reduction of CO2 uh, for a sustainable you know uh, energy provision. So uh, I think it's uh, and then if of course there's economic in incentive, then that can help us a lot. So uh, I think that the combination of these three, so the, so the, the contractual obligation that's not uh, there yet, and economic incentive that's maybe growing in Australia, but uh, not yet. And then, the, of course, the company, of course, uh, has a strong uh, uh, message. We have to, you know, disclose a strong message to transform ourselves, uh, like BP are doing. So, uh, um, so I think uh, for for Impex to move ahead uh, on CCS, I think that's a combination of these three. Thank you very, very much for that, um, uh, Dr. Takahashi. Uh, very much appreciate your your um, answer. My clock says we're out of time. Uh, there are so many questions we could continue with and enjoy this discussion. And I hope in the future we get that opportunity, but face to face rather than in this format. So first of all, I'd like to very much thank all of the panel members who've given up their time today for a wonderful contribution. And, and thank you so much for answering the questions. And just before I uh, leave Nambo San, I would like to thank our co-hosts and all of the participants today for, for a wonderful session and a great day. I've learned so much. I just wish I was actually in Tokyo with you to enjoy it. But there's always somebody that I feel as an English speaker who has no Japanese language skills whatsoever. There's somebody I must thank. Uh, and it is my uh, very dear friend, Mrs. Nishimura, and her team of interpreters who are, are just extraordinary people who do such a wonderful job. And I want to thank you ever so much from all of us who are so lacking in language skills that we can only speak English and we rely completely on you. And you, as always, have done a wonderful job. So thank you very much. And uh, Hiroshi, back to you to close up. Thank you very much, Mr. Blackpage. What I wanted to say has been already been said by Mr. Page. But nonetheless, today uh, we were able to have very active discussions. And I would like to thank all of you, Mr. Blackpage, and all the other speakers. I would like to thank all of you for CCUS to be deployed in Asia in order to realize a low emission society in the future. This is very crucial. I believe uh, this has been made amply clear throughout our discussion from the morning. We were able to share information and had a good discussion. And these are important. But as Mr. Brad Page, in his facilitation, we have been able to have good discussion on networking and that uh, perhaps we can share the storage for the whole Asian region, the networking is quite important in the future for the CCUS uh, to be further deployed if the uh, Global CCS Institute could, could be of some help but we will be very glad to do that with Japan CCS. From next year onwards we would like to continue to hold this forum. So from the next round onwards as well I hope that all of you will continue to actively participate. I'm looking forward for that. And part one during the morning and part two and part three in the afternoon. It has been a very long day, but I thank all of you for your very enthusiastic participation. And this concludes Japan Asia CCUS Forum 2020. Thank you for everyone. See you soon. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.